in the last class one of the listeners raised a very important and relevant point <clears throat> how is it possible or is it possible at all for anyone to start the practice of unselfish action i mean action without any attachment without any desire for the fruits for the results without any concern for the results of our action is it humanly possible <clears throat> and in response to this i just uh, made a few uh, introductory remarks it is not possible and it should not be possible it is even harmful that's because there are two psychological types among human beings this observation was made for the first time by shankaracharya the commentator on the gita himself who lived in 8th century we already discussed this matter at the very beginning two types of human beings those who are somewhat withdrawn contemplative they may be very active they may be very efficient very enthusiastic in the performance of their du- daily duties and responsibilities but they are of a withdrawing contemplative type and we normally call them wise men or wise women we spiritually enlightened mature we we often associate this wisdom with old age no oriental tradition and of course biological biological age this in necessarily imply wisdom in fact but still that is the tradition and there is the other type active dynamic interestingly you find this even among nations not only individuals you look at the ancient civilizations egypt india china and you come or even i compare america with the european nations with the strong historical conservative cultural roots so there was an interesting comparison uh, in a famous book on administrative services i was at some access to that some kind of connection with that kind of training in india so one diplomat made an observation in international diplomatic circles nation leaders from young nations they are very vigorous very active a lot of body language gestures when they articulate things but you look at the oriental types you feel that you, we are not sure they were sleeping or not no expression on the face you find this half i the lids of half closed we don't know at the most they may just know their heads we are not sure whether they are expressing their agreement with your views or but they actually mean we are we are listening to you not we are agreeing with you but the, but leaders from america mostly they are very vigorous very active they show a lot of gestures body language they are very vigorous in expressing these ideas so you find how a young he- healthy boy or girl behaves in comparison with an aged mature grandfather grandma that you find even civilizations in nations and also in cultures so biology sometimes plays an important role in the evolution of wisdom now what shankaracharya says in the beginning i quoted dividhohi vedokto dharmah pravrti lakshano nivrti lakshana sch jagat sthiti karanam shankaracharya makes a very interesting statement at the very beginning of the his commentary on this gita incidentally it is shankaracharya's commentary that we must thank for reading or discussing gita today because if shankaracharya had not written a commentary on the gita we won't be reading gita today gita was gita would have been submerged forgotten because it is a very small um comparatively insignificant fraction of a huge work classical work which is more which has got more than 100000 verses and gita has for only 700 verses it is shankaracharya's masterly commentary that made this book so unique and so universal and so 
well known as a spiritual classic. Now he makes this remark, among human beings there are two psychological, cultural types. Two types of attitudes, the contemplative and the active. The contemplative he called nevertheless action, I means withdrawing type. You can find in human behavior, oh, the, 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 the bank, the share market has collapsed. If you are, if you are a philosopher, oh, this is part of human life. You know, worry. But those who are not of a contemplative type, they may, they will have shocks. They will have to consult. Uh, help, they might do undergo health counseling and all that. So, two types of human beings. Those who are naturally of a contemplative type are fit for combining action and contemplation. They are fit for karma yoga. They are fit for the practice of action without any attachment, without too much of obsessive attachment to the results of their actions. But those who can never work without a strong motive, without, without a definite plan, a scheme, a well laid out uh, plan for their work, such people should never Practice karma yoga. They should slowly evolve to that status. Not that the doors and windows are closed before them. They can certainly evolve. They should. But then they should not all of a sudden start practicing action without any attachment for the results. Because the natural tendency is to work with a, with a definite motive. If you remove that motive from their mind and if they, if they start practicing their duties and responsibilities, performing the duties and responsibilities, without any motive, they will become indisciplined, their mind will go astray, there will be a vacuum created in their mind. Because normally, they will have a well laid out plan. That plan is removed then they won't be able to coordinate their faculties, mind or senses of perception or senses of action. So, Lord Krishna, the teacher of Gita, gives a very strong warning to those people. This is the Sanskrit verse. Literally means, don't try to create confusion. Don't try to tell a person who is habitually naturally inclined to work with a definite motive to practice all of a sudden the ideal of karma yoga. Don't do that. We must graduate to that level. We must slowly evolve to that level. Because these two distinct psychological types, the contemplative and the active, natural in human history. Many historians like Toy and B who elevated history to the status of philosophy and metaphysics, has analyzed these two types. He calls them Greco-Roman type and Oriental type. The Greco-Roman, the coming from the ancient Athenian and Spartan cultural ethos, action, perfection, conquest of natural forces. Uh, all this dynamic uh, way of living a meaningful, uh, well-coordinated, disciplined life. But all for making the five elements, I mean, making use of the five elements for making, for making a life more comfortable. The other type, toy and beams, are called the contemplative type, mostly. It is uh, associated with the Vedantic tradition, the Vedic tradition, this, the tradition of Confucius, Buddha and uh, the Lavodse, uh, to some extent, the Shinto tradition. Now, in the third chapter, Lord Krishna is dealing with this very subject, with the very topic. And there is a context, is a very famous discussion of this problem of action and contemplation. Can we act and at the same time be aware of the limitations of action.
can we because apparently they are contradictory in nature if you are contemplative in nature then you can't be physically and mentally very dynamic and active if you are always active then you cannot be contemplative Appar there is an apparent contradiction i shall read out this introduction of shankaracharya's verses then we will discuss this subject शास्त्रस्य प्रवृत्ति निवृत्ति विषय भूदे द्वे बुद्धि भगवद निर्दिष्टे सांख्ये बुद्धि योगे बुद्धि इति च तत्र प्रजगादि यदा कामान इति आरभ्य आ अध्याय परिसमाप्ते हि सांख्य बुद्धि आश्रितानां सन्यासं सन्यासं कर्तव्यम् उक्त्वा तेषां तन्निष्ठतया एव च कृतार्थता उक्ता एषा ब्राह्मी स्थिति इति अर्जुनाय च कर्मण्येवाधिकारिस्ते माते संगोष्ठा कर्मणि इति कर्म एव कर्तव्यं मुक्तवान् योगबुद्धिमाश्रित्य न तद एव श्रेय प्राप्तिं मुक्तवान् तद एतद् आलेपिय कर्याकुली भूद बुद्धि अर्जुन उवाच नाउ दिस एन इंट्रोडक्शन टू द थर्ड चैप्टर ऑफ द गीता अर्जुनास क्वेश्चन व्हिच इंसिडेंटली इज द वेरी क्वेश्चन व्हिच वी ऑल डिस्कस्ड टुवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ द लास्ट क्लास एंड लुक एट द कॉन्टेक्स्ट Arjuna was facing a big crisis, psychological crisis. So Krishna told him, first Krishna told him, the teacher told him, you should work. You should not be lazy. You should not try to run away from the field of responsibilities. You are worried about the problems associated with work. And you think that you can uh, solve the problems of action by running away from action you can solve the problems the anxiety the difficulties the uncertainties the risks and so many other problems related to our normal human activities so you want to run away from them you want to avoid them for that you are trying to run away from action itself you are wrong you can solve the problems related to action only through the medium of action not by running away from action that is krishna's reply but then arjuna won't understand it at this very beginning you can very easily understand somebody ask you well i am worried i am uh, i i don't want to do something a student will i feel anxiety i feel problems i feel uh, anxiety neurosis or some problem so i can't work i can't study no normal our normal response will be well you you should do you should work if you don't work you won't get results you won't get a job that's exactly what lord krishna tells arjuna if you don't work and if you fail if you get a low uh, a low grade then your parents have may have spent a lot of money or may have taken you may be working hard for tuition fees all this will go in vain all your efforts will go in vain so you your whole life will become a failure therefore you must work this is the first reply which lord krishna gives to arjuna and after giving this reply the teacher tells him atman is only reality consciousness is only reality this body comes and goes but there is something within this body which doesn't come and doesn't go because it always exists it is atman it is consciousness it is universal soul it doesn't die it doesn't get destroyed when the body gets destroyed this high philosophy is preached at the next stage so and then lord krishna says these great spiritual seekers who want to reach who want to realize this supreme consciousness they withdraw from everything they contemplate they meditate so arjuna thought then i would rather do that see that's that's what he says at krishna when krishna told him about the characteristics of a yogi which we described in the last in the last two three classes from 55 to 72nd verse of the second chapter of the gita long description of a highly evolved person a spiritually evolved person who sits calm and quiet contemplative who is not worried about anything 
who is not shocked, who is not moved, who doesn't seek action, but who doesn't avoid action like that. Like an ocean. Hundreds of rivers pour their waters into ocean, empty their waters into ocean, but the ocean remains totally unchanged, with unmoved. It doesn't request the rivers to bring water. It doesn't ask them not to bring water. It remains calm and quiet. That is a comparison given to the mind of a yogi, of a supreme spiritual person, enlightened person. Now, now Arjuna told Krishna, well, I would rather be a yogi than a spiritual seeker, than an average man who has to do all this work, everything. Now, if suppose, suppose uh, instead of Arjuna, a great spiritual person like Buddha had told, or Jesus had told, Krishna, Krishna this teacher, Krishna would have agreed, all right, you are fit for that. But Arjuna was a very, very ordinary man. Arjuna was a man of action. Suppose a businessman or an, of, or an official or public servant who has to work very hard, he finds there are some difficulties in the work in the working place. And he says, I'm going to resign. I would rather lead a contemplative life. But the, the next moment he will be seeking another job. And there also he may find he may encounter the same type of problems. The problems are in his or her mind, not outside. So the first stage for any human being is to do one's duties and responsibilities with full dedication, with full identity, with full concentration. That's the first stage. If you if you can work only with a definite motive, if you can work only with a scheme, with a well, you may be selfish motive, but to do that, then remain inactive. Because if you if you remain inactive without reaching the status of contemplation, that inactive state of mind is self-destructive. Even if we do not consciously engage ourselves in our duties and responsibilities, our mind and our senses of action and senses of perception will invariably be involved in different activities. If we do not deliberately try to work ourselves as a, I mean, as a master, we will have to work as a slave. So, the first instruction to any ordinary, any ordinary human being is to do, do our duty and responsibility. If we cannot do that as a karma yoga, then do that as an ordinary, with, as, a, as, a, as a duty and as a responsibility. So who is fit to be yogi? The one who is already full conscious of his duties and responsibilities, who can by his or her very nature, perform his duties and responsibilities with efficiency and enthusiasm. Such people alone are fit for the practice of karma yoga. So karma yoga is, is a matter of our spiritual evolution. It's not a matter of choice. We cannot choose that. We have to slowly evolve to that state. But we can evolve to that status by slowly keeping our mind uh, acquainted or associated with these ideas and then performance of activities and responsibilities. So I shall come to the third chapter. A very, this uh, Arjuna is asking one question, the first verse of the third chapter. Arjuna totally misunderstood Krishna's words. Jayasi chit karmanaste madha buddhi janardana tatkim karmani ghore mam niyojayasi keswa. This is, this is two verses. I am just reading these verses, reciting these verses, quoting these verses, but later you can read and understand. I shall explain. So, Arjuna is, uh, is, is discussing a serious problem. You told me that one should be wise, one should be a yogi, one should not 
be active in always engaged in different duties and responsibilities. This is Arjuna's misunderstanding. Remember, if somebody is, if a person who is habitually lazy, lethargy, is not willing to do any work. If you tell him or tell her, well, you should not do too much of work, you should contemplate, you should meditate. That person will misunderstand. Well, contemplation, that is very easy. And this work is very complicated. It's, it's, this, it, there are many risks, many problems. There are challenges, competition, insecurity, uncertainties. All these are invariable in work area. So these problems for normally wakes our mind. So if you tell such a person, well, you better uh, withdraw from all this and try to spend, uh, try to lead a contemplative life. That person will be very happy. But actually it is a terrible misunderstanding. Because that person may not be fit for leading the contemplative life. He is not willing to do his duty and to run away from the problems of duty. He is turning to contemplation. If he tries to contemplate, his mind will become a source of nuisance. You can very easily I can understand this if you listen to this imagery. See, mind is a lake, as I said last time. It has different layers. When we meditate, what happens? We are actually taking a long pole and we are trying to stir the lake of our mind. And what happens? Different conflicting thought currents come to the surface. Different layers of weeds and filth and dust will come to the surface because, because the water the water level, pure water is only at the, I mean, by the, by the two feet deep. Below that is all dirt and filth and weeds. So if you try to clean that lake, what happens? All the dirt and filth will come to the surface. So a person who is not mentally fit for contemplation, if he sits for contemplation, what happens? All these conflicting thoughts, thought currents come to the surface. I'm talking about serious meditation. If you practice relaxation, there is no problem. Relaxation is good. I'm talking about serious contemplation. Because serious contemplation is uh, like taking a long pole and stirring this muddy lake. That's why people feel like running away from the seat where they are sitting for meditation or japa. People feel restless. So you find in the lives of many great spiritual personalities, we can, we can read about it, Satan coming to tempt, different temptations appearing before them. It is only a symbolic presentation of the psychological conflicts emerging within the mind. These psychological conflicts are portrayed in picturesque language, Satan coming and tempting. You find in Buddha's life, for example, Mara coming and tempting. Actually, what happens when a person seriously meditates, all these conf conflicting thought currents come to the surface. But slowly, a spirit, if, a, if the person is really sincere, if he fit, he will be able to overcome all these temptations and reach his or her goal. But if you are not fit for that, it can lead to more complications, more confusions. So Arjuna was terribly confused. Arjuna thought that he can solve the problem of action, problems of action by running away from action. Then in reply to this, Lord Krishna um, make some very important statements. Lokesmin dividhanishtha pura prokta mayanaka jnana yogena sankhyanam karma yogena yoginam. This is the verse. It comes the third, third verse of the third chapter. In the whole human history, there are two types. There are those 
who are highly evolved they can do everything they can be active 24 hours of the day 7 days of the week still they can remain like the ocean which is which remains unmoved even when even if hundreds of rivers empty their waters into it totally unmoved so this is the path of knowledge the other path is the, the path of action karma yogi na yogi na yoga and those who are not of this type they practice they reach the same goal through yoga by the practice of karma yoga so karma yoga can be practiced by those who are active in this world who first do their duties and responsibilities and then when they find well when all these actions are not enough we have got enough money enough wealth enough status everything reputation everything but then at one point of our life we recognize the fact well we don't we won't carry all this when we go away from this world when the body drops everything behind nothing is left so maybe at that time we start thinking well what was the meaning of all my activities why did i why did i spend all my time and energy for accumulating things which which i have to leave behind when i leave this body behind that is the beginning of wisdom and that's the beginning of spiritual inquiry then we start practicing yoga if we could do that earlier we are wise otherwise nature will force us to turn in that direction there are two types of spiritual inquiry one nature forcing us compelling us to turn to spiritual life and then there is the other thing before we are forced by nature to turn to spiritual values we make a choice early in life that is better and that is the wisdom one important purpose of reading the scriptures or listening to this idea is we we get a chance to get this idea in time and start a new chapter in our life give a new direction to the course of our activities in fact that is one important purpose of the scriptures so the commentator of this scripture geet shankaracharya says with with regard to the role of scriptures it could be any scripture gita bible or any spiritual literature what is the purpose it tells us to do certain things which we normally do not remember to do in the course of our day to day activities we sometimes overlook certain fundamental vital truths of existence so when we are immersed in this in our day to day activities maybe for acquiring the necessities of human our life wealth comforts and many things like that sometimes we forget the fact that these things are necessary but these things do not constitute the supreme goal of human existence because human life is not a journey that ends with a piece of stones with a bouquet and a few flowers all around when the body is pushed through that crematorium the machine is the end of human life if that is the end of human life then human life is not very different from the life of plants and animals so scriptures give us uh, a forewarning long before the destiny or circumstances compel us to 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 think in this direction scriptures give some idea and if we can take the hint the hint from the scriptures then we can practice yoga then we can think of turning our action into a combination of a synthesis of action and contemplation which is called karma yoga 
So here Lord Krishna says, at the very beginning of creation, this twofold path was taught by me, taught by God in that sense. One is the path of knowledge for the meditative, for the contemplative, and the path of work for the active. For those who are active, those who are of an active temperament, they can, they should remain active, but along with the action, they should also become aware of the fact that action is not the only thing that counts, that is important in life. And for that, we must remember, human life is not just a linear progression, beginning from birth and ending with the crematorium. Rather, death is only a creative crisis, a transition point. Death teaches two important points. One, the perishable nature of this body. Second, the imperishable nature which remains intact even after the body is gone. That is, these are the two fundamental teachings of death. You can find this point discussed in the Kathopanishad, where the student Nachiketa asks for the third boon, Yayam Prete Vijigitsa Manushi Asti Tege Nayam Asti Vijayake, Edad Vidya Manishishta Stoyakam Varana Mesha Varastrati Tridiyaha. The small boy asks for a great boon. What is a boon? Some people say this body, when the body is gone, everything is gone, nothing is, nothing remains. Some other people would say, well, when this body is gone, everything is not lost. Something remains which is beyond this body, which remains immortal. So the body, bodily existence is not the only thing in human life. Please teach me this truth. So, those who realize this truth, they try to turn karma into karma yoga. Because if you are satisfied with karma, then a point of crisis comes where we, if we are lucky, we may get an opportunity to listen to this idea, these scriptures, where we get a chance to turn a new leaf in our life. Otherwise, we turn in the opposite direction and again this cycle continues. Of course, we will discuss that point later. Now, here, Lord Krishna is making an interesting statement, the fourth verse. It's a very interesting point. Now the point is this, I already discussed this point earlier. By not doing work, you cannot reach the highest transcendental state of spiritual enlightenment. Not, not by giving up work. You have to remember the context Gita's context. The context of Gita should be kept in mind to understand some of the vital points. But you should remember the philosophy of Gita goes far beyond the historical context of the setting of Gita. The setting of Gita is only incidental. But then in certain verses to understand the implication of certain verses but remember here is a man, Arjuna is active by nature, very ambitious, armed to the teeth. He has come to the battlefield. He is a soldier. He is fighting for the good. He tries to protect the good, the virtues from the wicked, evil monsters. That is the duty for which he has come. So he is a good man. He may be fighting, but he is fighting only for preserving peace in the world. So, his action is not bad. But then what happens is, he says suddenly, he says, well, I am not willing to work. It's not very different from a farmer who refuses to do farming or for a pilot who midday says, well, I won't, I won't work. <laughs> what will be the result? Not very different. If a pilot is... Uh, flying is plane, if he said, no, I am not willing to work anymore. It's not very different. That's the Arjuna status. So, and the reason why Arjuna said this, 
I mean, how he expressed his unwillingness to work. Not that he was lazy. He had already a good reputation for active, dynamic, uh, efficient character. He was a man of action by reputation. But then he said that I'm feeling anxious. I feel worried. I feel depressed with regard to my duty. So I want to run away from this inner problems and crisis. So I want to avoid action. And if I could avoid action, then I can enjoy peace of mind. Nice karma really means a state of transcending action. I already stated this in the last two, three classes. When you reach the highest spiritual wisdom, you can maintain, we can maintain our mental poise, tra inner tranquility, even in the midst of all activities. Action, inaction, the distinction, the line of demarcation slowly vanishes. So, such an enlightened person can be always active. Still, he can look upon his own life as a drama. He can witness the drama of his own life as a spectator, not as an actor. In fact, in the writings of some post-Gita teachers, like Lao Tzu and Confucius, you can find it. Lao Tzu says, you know, work without work, going beyond both work and worklessness, all these types of things. Inner tranquility and outer activity. Because outer activity becomes a problem, it unsettles the mind, only when there is a link between action and mind. When mind and action remain detached from one from the other, then we could be always active, but enjoy perfect calm, peace and harmony within. This is the state which Krishna calls nice karma, means the state of transcending action, a state of transcending action and inaction. Always can re one can remain active, but without any worry, without any anxiety, without any botheration. In fact, that is, for such a person, it doesn't make much difference between action and inaction. If you can look upon every act as an act of worship, then action Actions do not make us exhausted or tired. What worship here doesn't mean the physical activity involved in external rituals. But you have to remember this point. Worship here means an action surrender. When we worship, when we do anything sacred with great concentration, we forget ourselves. Whatever we do with a great sense of sanctity, as, as a as a sacred act, we get so fully immersed in it that that act of worship doesn't make us exhausted or tired. If somebody tells, I am, I am tired of praying or I am tired of meditating, that person is not fit for praying or meditation. That's what it means. One could be act, tired of walking, running, but if one becomes tired of meditating or praying, or contemplating, it means that person is not mentally ready for that highly introspective action. Because introspective action or contemplation essentially produces inner harmony, peace and tranquility. Now this is the state which everyone is trying to reach. But if you try to reach this state by running away from action, you are in for trouble. Because our senses and mind are naturally prone to activities. Our eyes take our mind towards the different visual objects. Our ears take our mind towards audio objects. Our sense of smell will take our mind towards 
an object it produces perfume and so on this is natural we don't have to work hard to see an object and to uh, we should not work very hard for the for the eyes to drag our mind towards visual objects natural they are very natural therefore if we do not try if you do not learn the technique of diverting these senses of action senses of perception and mind to us creative spiritual channels then they will automatically drag the mind into opposite direction that will create problems so that's why krishna says by giving up action nobody can transcend action going beyond action is one thing avoiding action is another thing going beyond action means being always active but at the same time perfect calmness tranquility and harmony and peace within avoiding action means physically deliberately avoiding action but really it doesn't mean inaction it creates confusion and anxiety and botheration in the fifth verse a very important my point is made by the teacher nahi ka shikshanam abhi jadu tishthati akarma krta kare dekhi avashyak karma sarva prakriti jayi ki gunai a very interesting point is made nobody in this world remains quiet inactive even for one split second does anybody remain inactive in the world nobody even as i said earlier even if you are relaxing in an easy chair our mind will be active mind will be speculating thinking dreaming of different things physically we are inactive but mind becomes hyperactive so one can never remain inactive mentally and physically at the same time if we do not try to give a creative diversion to our mind and the senses of action and senses of perception then mind will be dragged into self destructive channels there is an interesting uh, imagery in one of the famous works of vedanta shankaracharya draws the picture of five creatures showing how they lose how they lose their life how they get destroyed how they get ruined is a very allegorical metaphorical presentation of how external objects sometimes take us in the opposite direction and cause our downfall it takes five creatures from animal kingdom the verse is this shabda divi panjavireva panja panjattuma busa gunena baddha kuranga madanga padanga meena bhanga nara panjaviranjika this is a famous verse now uh, five creatures one deer then elephant then more then fish then some small tiny creatures that go about collecting honey from different flowers how they meet with their destruction this is the a very allegorical metaphorical presentation now take the first one the deer it is said that in ancient times the hunters used to play on some musical instrument hearing this music the deer hiding in a bush or a cave will come out and it will be killed the hunter will shoot an arrow and it will be killed now here uh the sense of hearing becomes the cause of his downfall of course the of course the ultimate aim of the author is to give a graphic picture of the condition of human beings that is the aim that's why this this imagery is given then what about the elephants you find elephants move in groups herds of elephant moving they touch each other 
for mutual protection. The big elephants will hold the baby elephants. And as they go, because of their attachment, they touch each other. They lose their direction and they fall in a pit dug by the approaches of human beings they, who want to enslave elephants, catch, capture them. So elephants lose their life because they, they, their mind is dragged by the sense of touch. So they lose their direction, they fall in a pit. Then move during rainy season. These small uh, insects, they emerge from the ground in large numbers. And people sometimes, they start a small fire. And seeing this blazing fire, the moths are drawn to us. They think that is something wonderful, the visual object. So the eyes, the, the sense of eyes become the cause of the downfall. Then what about fish? The fish is caught because it bites the bait. And the fishermen use this bait to uh, tempt the fish and they are caught. And then finally these small creatures that go about uh, collecting honey from flowers, they are attracted towards these flowers because of the, the smell, the aroma, the beautiful, the attractive smell of these flowers. So the sense of smell becomes the cause of the downfall. Now, finally, the answer, the, the author asks one question. What about human beings? Human beings are in a much more difficult, complicated position because all the time, every moment, all the five senses together drag our mind towards different objects. So mind is drawn towards these different objects. That is natural. Similarly, we human beings are by their very nature active. If they do not plan, if they do not deliberately discipline their actions with a definite motive, with a proper well laid out plan, what happens? Our activities, our actions become chaotic and they do not produce any desirable results. So it is natural for every human being to be active. So the first stage is to be active in a very intelligent manner. First we must shake off lethargy, laziness, and do our duties and responsibilities, maybe with a well laid out plan, with a scheme and all that. That will give us success. Gradual evolution of the human type is given here. Very natural. See, so look at the history of human civilization. With the coming of modern science and technology, with the industrial revolution, a small, small, tiny nations of Europe, Britain to begin with, then Holland, then Germany, much later, much later stage. All these nations, uh, they evolved, they developed certain techniques of conquering external nature. So suddenly, within 150 years, they all became rich. Then sea route was discovered to different colonial colonies and they amassed wealth from all over the world and they became rich. Now this is natural, the first stage. But then uh, at, there is a stage, at one stage, this wealth itself becomes the cause of downfall of civilizations. Science itself is a great friend, but also it could be a deadly enemy in the hands of the wrong person. So, this is true of human beings also. Our natural tendency is to remain active. So, this action should be coordinated, disciplined, and properly directed. That may help us to achieve success in the external world. But that success also produces certain problems. The most successful human beings, the wealthiest nations, are not the most peaceful ones in the world. The richest person doesn't necessarily become the most peaceful person. Often he becomes, 
a victim of all kinds of internal and external problems. Diabetes, hypertension, and also psychological problems. So Krishna says, at the next stage of evolution, we have to think of combining action with something that helps us to solve the problems of success. It is called problems of success. Problems of abandonment. Problems of plenty. And that is possible only through yoga. So that's why Lord Krishna makes an interesting statement. Combining action with contemplation enables us to turn action to karma yoga. Now again in the sixth verse the teacher gives a strong warning against the, against the tendency to run away from action and then look upon that inaction, lethargy as yoga. You know there is a lot of misunderstanding in this regard. Sometimes if you look at the history of different nations and civilizations you find many nations and civilizations which have been went through long periods of golden eras slowly became economically weak, socially divided and they lost their freedom. Swami Vivekananda makes some very interesting observations in this regard because he was aware of this problem. You find if you read, if you read Vivekananda's lectures in his life, he approaches this problem from, from two different angles. See, when he speaks about yoga and Vedanta in America and Europe, he speaks about the need for harmony and peace and restraint. You have accomplished so much through scientific and technological revolution. You have to remember, the fruits of industrial revolution benefited only the European nations to begin with. Later, uh, America also got the benefits. So Swami Vivekananda, when he speaks about this problem, he has two approaches. When he addresses Western nations, he emphasizes the need for self-restraint, spiritual values. Because science and technology and economic prosperity may give us the ability to conquer the external nature, but it also produces a lot of problems anarchy and indiscipline and licentiousness in private life, in personal life, in family structures, the collapse of family structures. All this Swami, Swami Vivekananda mentions. In fact, in one context in American lecture, he says, if you look, go travel all over this country, there is so much of organization, prosperity, science, technology, everything. The five elements are dancing to the tunes of the Yankees, Swami Vivekananda's statement. I mean, conquering the whole external things with the help of science and technology, new discoveries. But there is, of course, they said, there is a sobbing, wailing sound below. So much of joy, so much of happiness, so much of jubilation, but so many inner problems which science and technology have no way of solving. Science and technology may help us to conquer distances, increase and improve physical comforts, economic comforts and so on. But there are certain inner, deeper problems which science and technology cannot address. We are going to refer to that. There is a there is a wailing sound. It's so below. Now it is, have, it is it equally applies to all modernized, westernized, urbanized Nations all over the world. Today it has become universal everywhere. All over the world you find the pockets of people, pockets of this external jubilation and internal anarchy, disharmony and uh, despair. But when he travelled in India, he spoke in a different language. There he said, you have to make use of modern science, technology, organization skill, leadership skills, innovation, and so on. So you can just imagine this. So 
for nations which have not solved the basic problems of economic and social backwardness, science and technology are necessary. But for nations which have solved these problems, still not solved the deeper and inner problems, spirituality is the only way. Yoga is the only way. But there is always a, there is always a tendency among people to interpret inaction as spirituality and poverty as asceticism. There is an element of hypocrisy in it. It is Vegan the Lord Krishna is referring to that. See sixth verse Karma Indriyan Shamyamya I Aste Manasas Maran Indri Artha Nimudharma Mithyas Mithya Acharaha Savuchida. You think of a person who remains totally inactive. If you ask him, he will say, What's the use of money? But he will he will be very happy if you give him one dollar. He may even beg for a dollar. But he will also tell you, this is not a real case, my scenario. I'm giving the the implication of this sixth verse in the third chapter. A particular stage of human evolution, that's a problem. That's a subject here, not a real case scenario. People who want, people who are enamored of economic prosperity, external comforts, if they do not work for that, and if they remain inactive out of laziness and lethargy, and they interpret their inaction as spirituality, as contemplativeness, that is wrong. Such a person is a hypocrite. A strong word is used, hypocrisy. Mithyacharya means somebody who is a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is Mithyacharya. That's what Vegan. Lord Krishna says. This may not apply to, uh, to modern civilizations. But it drives home one point. We have to gradually evolve to a higher level of spiritual evolution. So, for the person who has worked, who is working, who is efficient, who is enthusiastic, who is successful, and still is aware of this so-called, the limitations of the so-called success, that person is fit for yoga. But then, even while working hard for these, for maintenance, for, for making both ends meet, if one could keep in mind this higher spiritual value, that person can practice Karma Yoga and he can evolve even faster. That's how you get behind. So, that is the implication of the sixth verse. I think we have taken a little more time than usual. Now we'll have a discussion, maybe we are a bit late. Still, if there is any point that you will want me to discuss, I'll be happy to do that. Any question at this point or in general? Yes, practicing karma yoga and doing karma yoga are really the same. Uh, you know, practice of karma yoga relates to a, an overall attitude. So, karma yoga really means our total approach and attitude. So far as the action itself is concerned, there is no difference. Is the approach, our mental approach, towards what we do that makes the difference. So, practice of Karma Yoga and doing Karma Yoga are the same, really speaking. So, it is more a matter of how we approach the whole problem of what we do and what we don't do. That's what it really is concerned with. Oh yes, you know, uh, mindfulness becomes a natural characteristic of a person who is established in Karma Yoga. Because that, that element of detaching our mind from what we do enables us to 
detached from anxiety and concern for the results what we do it's really karma yoga itself my it is mind that gets attached to what we do and and also its result so mindfulness in being aware of it so that enables us to delink that connect connection between mind and the results of what we do that's the idea attachment is only the link between mind and the results of actions so that is broken through mindfulness that is a natural state of a person who is established in the ideal of karma yoga perhaps we today we discussed a bit too long i mean the subject we will if uh, there is any more question we are open i will conclude and then nothing then we'll conclude now if you if you if you, any of you who want more points to be discussed in this session we can have an exchange of ideas you are most welcome you can uh, come ready in the next session om shanti shanti shanti